next 60 minutes, we're going to take a look back at this weekend's events. So don't go anywhere as we make that long trek. Over 7,000 feet later, the runners finally reached their destination for Saturday, merely a turning point for Sunday. This is the summit, 14,110 feet. But let's get back to the bottom and start of Saturday's ascent. Here's a look at what these runners are actually in for in the ascent and the marathon as well. You can see the trail on the way up. Actually, you start running on a road in Manitou Springs, but when you get to Bar Trail itself, the first two miles of that trail take you up 3,000 feet. Here's a look at the trail head on as you would look at it. Zigzag your way up the mountain until you finally reach the summit and the end or just the halfway point on Sunday. It was a beautiful morning. This is shot from about halfway up Pikes Peak, the sun rising. We sent our photographers up early to bring all this wonderful video back to you. Here's what it looked like from down low. A beautiful day down in Manitou Springs. It would not be that way as they headed up. The runners picking up their packets, their t-shirts and numbers, and getting ready and stretching out, stretching out the muscles, warming up the muscles to head up the assault on Pikes Peak. We had runners from 46 different states and four foreign countries turn up for the ascent this year. And as always, a huge group from Arkansas, 66 people, the ascent, 127 the marathon. But why do these people want to run this race? We drove, we went up on the car yesterday and uh, it gave us a little idea of what it's going to be like. But I think it's going to be okay. Do you, have, do you have any idea what you're getting yourself into? Well, I hiked it about four years ago and so I got a little idea, but probably not good enough or I wouldn't be here. From the flatlands, we don't have any hill higher than an overpass. Well, uh, does that bother you at all, the elevation, the altitude going from maybe whatever, your three or four hundred feet to fourteen thousand feet? Let me think. Yes. <laughs> I have got an unofficial weather report for you right now, and I'm not pulling your leg that it's 25 degrees and 50 mile an hour winds right now at the uh -huh. top. Really? Is that right? Keep the jacket. <laughs> keep we'll the keep jacket. We'll keep the jacket. <laughs> we got gloves and a jacket. I think we're going to need it. What uh, kind of made you decide that uh, this is the year I'm going to try the race? I'm just nuts, I think. <laughs> Completely insane. For a person that's ran eight times in a row, do you have a strategy or is it just run to like drop? Yeah, actually, um, the my strategy is run as slow as I can up until A-frame and then go as fast as you can. I mean, I think you really have to hold back at the beginning. No, other runners do not take that advice. They prefer rather not to hold back at the beginning and come straight out running on the asphalt. A lot of runners are better at road races and not mountain races, and this maybe they feel they can make up some time. Two waves needed to start this race because there's 1,750 runners this year, so they go with one wave, about half of them at 7 a.m., and then the second half starts at 7.30. This run through great downtown Mantu Springs, you can see it is beautiful, and Scott Elliott is taking the lead at this point. He is in the front in the blue shorts, some other Triple Crown contenders behind him at this point. But isn't it nice for the people of Manitou Springs to let us run through their city, actually what turns out to be an entire weekend on Saturday for the ascent and then the marathon on Sunday. But Scott Elliott looking strong at this point, maybe not too good in the fact that he is bare chested. He's going to come up against some treacherous winds when he gets up on the mountain, but Scott's been there before. He won four of the last five races. Here they go up towards the trailhead, still on asphalt. You see Craig Dixon to the left of Scott Elliott there. This is Craig's first attempt at the, the ascent race. And Dennis Leck is right behind Scott Elliott at this point. Both of those men, of course, going for Triple Crown, trying to win the Triple Crown. But we will soon find out they would not do so as we head up to Bar Trail on to what Scott Elliott likes. This, the dirt trail, the pack now coming through. A lot of these people taking their time. They know the pace that they have to run in order to reach the summit of Pikes Peak. Most of these people preferring to jog. You will see some people scattered about that like to run. But something that needs to be pointed out at this point is this pretty much is a one-person trail all the way up the mountain. This part a little bit wider, but here you can really see it, the agony of defeat. These people have to be ready and jockey for position as well as try and find their rhythm as they head towards the top.
Here we go to the switchbacks. This will look down at Manitou Springs from the switchbacks, which are really zigzagging their way up the mountain. At this point, Craig Dixon has the lead over Scott Elliott, but maybe he's pushing himself a bit too hard at this point. He is really burning himself out. You'll find out later that he would fall back amongst the pack. Third place at this point, John Ortega. He is running real well through the switchback, making his way. And here you see some more of the pack runners. What's important to realize about anyone who's going to run this mountain, though, is that you, the way you have to run, you have to take short steps. You'll notice how short of steps these runners are taking, as well as using their entire foot. They're not running on the balls of their feet. They are rolling their foot and using it. That way, they won't burn out their calves on this climb. Remember, the first two miles of Bar Trail itself is a 3,000-foot climb. see a lot of people packing their own water. There are several water stations along the mountain, but it's a good thing to pack your own as well. Who knows when you're going to need that little extra nourishment to keep you going. And you see people pumping the arms, using the arms to help themselves through, giving a little wave at the cameras as they go by. But the switchbacks also help you in that you can see the fence. A lot of runners prefer to like put a hand on the fence to help them go through. Here, this is actually the second wave now coming through the switchbacks a little bit later in the morning. It's about 8 o'clock now, and you will notice the trail. What makes this trail so hard is that it is rocky. There are loose rocks and loose gravel on your way up there, and you really have to watch your footing as well as, as we said, jockey for position. You see the man there falling a little bit. He was good in that he got his hand down and kept himself going, which is another thing. You'll see some of these people donning gloves a little bit later as they head up towards some of the rockier portions of the mountain. Here you can see some of the gear these people are wearing. Some of them have shirts and jackets tied around themselves, maybe a bit more prepared than even the leader, Scott Elliott, at this point, who was bare-chested. These people have coats that they can put on as they get into that windier weather up towards the top of Pikes Peak. You can see the sun just beating down on their backs as they head up the trail. At this point at the mountain, the runners get to stop and see a sign. They've got 12 more miles to go, 7,200 feet of climb. And this is what it looks like up a little bit later in the mountain as they reach the top, about a mile and a half down, is a place known as the Cirque, a 1,500-foot drop to one side, the trail to the other side. Up that trail comes Scott Elliott, the leader at this point. You can see him moving through, and he looks fantastic coming through this point of the mountain. And you can really see the wind at this point through his hair and blowing his shorts as he comes by our photographer through the Cirque. I told you Craig Dixon was going to fall off. He did. Second place at this point is Chris Nelson, a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy from Florence, Colorado. He's run this race before and he looks like it. He's moving and possibly keeping an eye on Scott Elliott. In third place, John Ortega as well, looking good as he heads through the Cirque. The first woman at the Cirque, Janie De La Cour. We've seen her before. She would do it again. She won two of the last three would end up winning the three of her last four because she took the race today. Here's another good look at the wind. You see the search and rescue crew trying to put up a sign. Uh, we had the same sort of trouble up on the peak. Here comes our second place woman, Gwen Martinez, and she prefers to walk through the circuit. But you can see, even at this level, that she is keeping her feet flat on the ground, trying not to burn out the calves. Speaking of flat feet, how about this, taking your best friend up the mountain and uh, a dog's eye view, so to speak. Looking good, really. Looking strong. Looking strong. Some of our other female contenders, Vicki Ash and Jolene DeWall, who would end up in third and fourth place in the women's race, water, respectively. Water, water. But here's a look at one of the water stations along the, the mountain. A lot of the runners need water. And, and we're having fun. <laughs> Except for the wind, right? Except for the wind. The wind is miserable. Well, this is bikini weather for what for the wind. Oh, it, it is cold. 
long as you're you moving. What's that? Peach. Well, go. Yeah. Crash bag in the corner. Hang on to your cup. Ooh. You're almost there. Just a mile. Good job. Hang on to your cup. All right. That water station is about a mile from the summit, which is kind of misleading. These runners still have a heck of a climb to go before they reach their uh, destination on this day, which is the top of Pikes Peak. Of course, in the ascent, and R. Mark Austin is going to tell us how the water gets there to help the runners. Whether running the ascent or the marathon, once reaching the 16 Golden Stairs, you are thankful for the three water stops that have helped quench the thirst that burns at your throat and mouth. Without water, a race up the peak would be nearly impossible. This is the critical item on the race, is the water, because the runners need to stop and take water at each one of these locations because of the, of the mountainous terrain that they're covering when they go up the mountain. Running up Pikes Peak is a challenge. Getting 1,200 gallons of water to the aid stations has been plain hard work. That is, before the soldiers at Fort Carson began helping out with the use of a Chinook helicopter. We could do it, but it would require a lot of work. Uh, it would require probably at the minimum about 10 hours labor on the part of individuals going up the mountain and stringing about 2,000 feet of hose down the mountainside. And it would uh, prevent us from having the number of uh, aid stations and water stations that we have up there with the use of the helicopter. Two trips were needed to place over 13,000 pounds of payload along the trail to the top of the peak. The job of rigging the water to the bottom of the helicopter belonged to the hookup man. Mainly, I, I res, I'm responsible for rigging the load, make sure it's a safe load, that we're not going to drop anything in route to our, where we're going to drop it off at. But uh, I'll, I'll jump down there and hook it up, and it's, it gets pretty exciting at times, depending on how close the aircraft gets to you. Once the load was attached, the trip over Cheyenne Mountain and on to Pikes Peak began. Fort Carson gets several requests every year to use their Chinook helicopters like this. When they do, they want people to know that it also helps their pilots keep up their proficiency. Yeah, that's the main thing, you know. Um, we're not, the Army doesn't agree to do these kind of things just for the sake of doing them. Um, the people, they, they need the training. So, you know, if they're going to have to get the training anyway and they can help out the community at the same time, then yeah, you know, why not? Getting the Chinook low enough to drop the water got kind of tricky. One wrong move could have caused the loss of the payload or worse. What's going on is our, our rotor disc is getting uh, close to the mountainside. So you have one, one personnel is watching that end. Then you got somebody else watching the load and we're worried about the person on the bottom. At one point, uh, somebody stood underneath the load so we had to kind of get them out of the way. touchdown or make that splashdown without these guys the water might not have been there they made it easier on both the runners and the course workers who would have had to drag the water a long way to quench the thirst of so many for the pikes peak marathon i'm mark austin the next portion of the mountain is known as the 16 golden stairs and you can see how rocky it is on your way the last portion up to the summit of Pikes Peak. It really is tough in that it is made basically out of boulders. You can see the huge masses of rock and it's called 16 Golden Stairs because you really do have to step up to make your way to the top. There is our leader, Scott Elliott, at this point moving through and being cheered on and the woman's leader, Janie Day LaCour, moving on through. But you again can see the wind and you can see the search and rescue people bundled up trying to keep themselves warm and keep out of that wind. You have to huddle up against a rock or something. Janie Day kind of slowing down, taking her time getting to the top. She has a surmountable lead at this time. There you see a man with a big, heavy winter jacket on. Gwen Martinez, the second place woman at this point, cruising on through, getting some encouragement, opting to walk at this point on her way towards the top. another good look at some of the boulders and you can see some of the runners opting to wear gloves which actually is the better way to go because once you get up there you can help yourself through those large rocks by putting your hands on the boulders that believe it or not a shot of downtown Denver from the top of Pikes Peak 
And this looks calm and cool and collected. Believe me, it was not on Saturday. Winds of 40 miles per hour blowing steadily, gusts of up to 60 miles per hour, and a wind chill of 10 degrees. Here's some people helping and just trying to get out of the wind at this point because no one had reached the top, but he would come soon. Scott Elliott, believe it or not, in a time much the same as he ran last year, he would make it to the top, and boy, does he look strong coming through, but I can tell you, he's probably pretty cold at this point as he gets up here, bare-chested and all. This is Scott's fifth win of the Pikes Peak Ascent in the last six years as he waves to some of the volunteers along the way and gets that space blanket. Second place for the ascent Saturday, Chris Nelson, I mentioned before, graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. He came in about six minutes after Mr. Elliott, but a nice race for him nonetheless. In third place was John Ortega, and he was greeted by this nice warm dog who <laughs> was sheltered from the wind by the blanket. Uh, and here is Mr. Ortega, third place on the day, another few minutes behind Mr. Nelson. Fourth place, saw our first flatlander come to the top, Mark Blazer. And you can see he has the gloves, but he preferred not to lose his hat, took it off his head at that point. And yes, that's me in the hat, cheering the runners on and cheering on the first woman, Janie Day LaCour, as she made it to the top of the mountain. And you will notice there are plenty of volunteers. There are some 600 volunteers and race officials around for this race. That includes from the start all the way up here to the top. And what they do when they get these runners to the top is quickly wrap them in a space blanket to get their uh, body temperatures back up and help them along. This is a shot from the top of Pikes Peak looking down at the Cirque area. And you can see what an elevation you have to make just in order to get to the summit of Pikes Peak. Boy, there's some more bundled up people sheltering themselves from the wind. This, the second place woman on the day, Gwen Martinez, who came through a few minutes after Janie De La Cour, and she would take second on the day. But there were plenty of racers, as a matter of fact, 1,564 that finished this race. Scott Elliott talked to me about his climb after he was done. Five of the last six times you've won this thing. What made today's race different? The thing that made today's race different was that I was thinking Matt Carpenter was going to run until about the last minute, and he didn't show up. And I changed my plans a little bit. I uh, was less inclined to run really, really hard and go for a record. Also, that I heard that there was some really nasty wind up top, and that, that made me run a little bit more conservatively. There were a few switchbacks just above Timberline where I was almost at a dead stop, but uh, you know, conversely, you turn your back to it on the next switchback and you're getting pushed, so. Yeah. But I think, if you look at it too, I mean, what you ran it, and I think you ran it just over a minute, what you ran last year's in, and last year was much better. It was, it was pretty close to last year, but I, I'm in much better shape compared to last year, and I had a lot more in reserve. So if, if I had had competition and there wasn't any wind, I think the record would have dropped this year. Five out of six times. Are you, are you trying to prove something? Have you proved something? Do you want to say more? Yeah, I want to say more. I, I really like this race. I get up for it every year. I, I don't see why I'm not going to keep doing it. And uh, sooner or later, some young whippersnapper is going to come and try to knock me off. But until then, I'm going to try to stay king of the mountain. Did you go out today mainly trying to get back on top? Yeah, I didn't train quite as much this year for it, so I was a little more cautious. I, I went out real slow. Um, in fact, I, at bar camp, I was the slowest I've ever been. Really? So, but I made up a lot of time. I think I was probably the fastest in the last half. You know, I felt really good. Obviously, the wind was something. Uh, tell me about what you had to put up with. It was amazing. I, I've been up here probably 20 times, you know, and I've never seen wind like this. There were times where it was push you backwards, you know, and you couldn't keep your balance. So it was fun, you know. It was just, just laugh, you know. You can't do anything about it. This is the uh, eighth straight time, you said, that yeah. you've run this. Uh, are you going to make it eight straight more? Yeah, I keep doing it every year I can. It's getting to be a sentimental thing, so. The Triple Crown. I mean, uh, how many times... Do you have to win that before you can say, okay, I'm good enough and I can quit now? I'll never quit. <laughs> Just keep doing it every year. I enjoy it. 
Now here's a look at the top five finishers for Saturday's Pikes Peak Ascent. You see Scott Elliott, not a record, 2.11.11 was his time, followed by Chris Nelson, John Ortega. We mentioned Mark Blazer, the first Flatlander. He's from Howard's Grove, Wisconsin, and then another Coloradan from Telluride came in, Ricky Denisick, to grab a fifth place. As far as the ladies were concerned, you saw Janie De La Cure, her official time, 2.48.28. Then followed by Gwen Martinez, Vicky Ash was in third, Jolene DeWall was in fourth. She was the first non-Colorado racer to make it. She's from Bountiful, Utah. And then it was Nancy Stark Stevenson who came in in fifth place. She is from Denver, Colorado. Now there was a tragedy in Saturday's race. Bob Love, who was 58 years old from Earlham, Iowa, died of a cardiac arrest during the race. This was Bob's th third race on the mountain, a mountain which he loved. Unlike Saturday, Sunday brought what were really ideal conditions for the Pikes Peak Marathon. You saw the overcast up at the top. It was also a slight, slight bit overcast down in Manitou Springs, but it was incredible. Very little wind to speak of. Here you see the runners again warming up their muscles and getting ready for what really is twice the amount of running from the day before as they have to make the trek not only up, but also come on back down. 750 people registered this year to race this Pikes Peak Marathon. And I had a chance what to ask them why. You to want to do this? Well, I'd say as you get older, you get a little more brain dead. And when you lose a lot of brain cells, then you decide to do these kinds of things. So <laughs> that's why. Why wouldn't you just come like yesterday, take it a little bit easier, and just, just run to the top? Why do you I have did. to turn around? I'm doing both. I'm doing a double. OK, so first time I've done the ascent okay. and the marathon. But how stupid are you? Uh, well, people back home think I'm real stupid, but <laughs> I'm here. I'm why, here. why though? Why? What is it? Just the challenge of it? Just to say you've done it? Uh, will you do it again after this? Or? Yeah, I'll probably keep coming back. And it is the challenge. It's, it's the the mental training and the physical training that goes into being able to do something like this. Uh, how many times have you run this race? This is my second time. What possesses a person? to come out here, not necessarily just to run this marathon, but why don't you just come yesterday and just go to the top, forget about running now. Well, I like running downhill. I'm a little kamikaze and I like to go down and go fast. It's the only time I can beat my husband is running downhill, so I'd rather do the round trip than just up because he'd blow me away on that one. So. But, but do you beat him on the way down? or? I will today because he ran yesterday, so. <laughs> the man's nuts. He's crazy. <laughs> I did the ascent seven years ago and I thought maybe when I turn 50, I'll do the round trip. <laughs> Put the icing on the cake when, when you come downhill, so that's why I'm doing it. The start of the race was another beautiful conditions. You see the sun behind the runners as the race gun goes off, and here they are. And just like yesterday, where you saw Scott Elliott jump out to a lead, this time another runner would come out to the lead, and everyone knows his name. And that is Matt Carpenter. He's off to the right. The camera will pan over there. And he's over there along with some other contenders, Ricardo Mejia of Mexico, as well as Steve Smallzell, last year's winner. He is right there along with them. Running along, you see him on the left in the Mickey Mouse shirt. That's Matt Carpenter in the front of the race with the pink shorts on. He's running. He's got his coat ready for what could be some bad conditions on top, but it turned out today weren't bad at all as they run up through the streets of Manitou Springs for the second day in a row. You can see a lot of the people get up early that live in Manitou Springs come out to the street to cheer these runners on, especially on Sunday. They need all the help they can get because they've got 26 miles and more to go before they reach that finish line. And it's not just the mileage, it's the climb up the mountain. You can see as we reach the head of Bar Trail now that Matt Carpenter is really pushing ahead. He has quite a lead as he heads up onto the dirt. Actually told our cameraman it looked pretty dumb if I finished last now. And it would have. But Ricardo Mejia here is in pursuit. He's letting the lead get away, but he would be right behind Matt most of the way up. There's the pack heading up the trailhead. Again, you see the people, some preferring to walk, but most of them ready for what conditions they probably heard about yesterday's race and how cold it was at the top. They brought their gloves and coats and so forth. As we reach the switchbacks, the man all alone is Matt Carpenter, who is a veteran of this race. He knows what he's doing, but maybe not so much on this day. Might have been pushing himself a bit too much as he headed to the top of the mountain. He was looking for a record. He was 
pretty much right on record pace at this portion as he moved through the switchbacks still looking strong. Right behind him, Ricardo Mejia of Mexico City, Mexico, and he looks just as strong, if not more strong, coming through. This is Stan Fox, a veteran runner. As a matter of fact, he won the marathon back in 1986. He was the third man through the switchbacks on the bottom portion. The first woman through the switchbacks was was a Joe Gathercole of Wyoming. And she was behind this pack of runners, but right in there and doing quite well. As a matter of fact, she would hold her lead all the way through this race from the tops of Ruston Avenue. There you see Joe. She has the headband on and moving quite well. She's got her gloves for later on up the mountain. There's some of the pack runners running on through. And we asked our Mark Dawson to find out just how the runners prepare for this race. It's a subject that many people have many opinions on. Sports nutrition. Most experts in the field tell us to eat lots of green stuff lots of pasta, and drink plenty of liquids. But what about the opinions of the people who were preparing for their assault on the peak? And did they actually stick to what they believe in? I follow a real strict nutrition thing all the time, but not before the race. I, no, no particular food or anything, but I do uh, eat a high carbohydrate, low fat, low cholesterol diet. I try to do that. I'm not always good. It's staying away from chocolate and some of the sweets. Yeah, it's just as important to carbo load after a race as it is before a race because you've depleted everything and carbohydrates get into your system quicker than anything else. Have you ever had any first-hand knowledge of maybe not eating properly the day before and all of a sudden finding yourself in a, a brick wall? Matter of fact, I'm a little bit worried about that right now because my new, my new job I'm assigned to has created uh, an atmosphere around me to where I'm not able to eat properly and I haven't been able to train up real good. While good nutrition can help a well-trained athlete go a long way, if the feet don't want to go, the runner can't either. There's a lot you can do prevention-wise for a race like this, there is. But we'll still see probably almost 100 people today in the tent with foot problems. Okay. Wentz recommends runners cut their toenails short to ease the pounding of the descent and to rub Vaseline between the toes to ease the friction of long-distance running. What about when the race is over? The body is tired and just about everything aches. Well, it's time for a massage to soothe the pain. Massage is really helpful in recovering, especially from an event like the Pikes Peak Center Marathon because you put so much stress in your body uh, that it, it takes a long time for your body to recover from that amount of exercise. And massage is a way of uh, helping to assist the body in the recovery process. Especially on the round trip, uh, the, the downhill running is very, very hard on the legs, especially the quadriceps and the hamstrings and uh, the knee joint itself. And as the muscles fatigue, the, the bones of the leg that, uh, around the knee take more and more stress. And um, again, massage is a very valuable tool for helping the muscles recover and just helping the body heal itself a little bit faster. Massage, prepping the feet, and food? They might be things to think about before the race, but they're probably the last thing on your mind by the time you reach the Cirque. For the Pikes Peak Marathon, I'm Mark Austin. Speaking of the Cirque, that's exactly where our runners are about to come through. You see how beautiful it was on Sunday as opposed to Saturday. And the balloon shows you that there was hardly anyone to speak of compared with the day before. This looking down from the top at the Cirque and now down from the Cirque to our leader, Matt Carpenter, who's pushing himself quite well through this point. And as he comes through the Cirque, you see he's looking strong. He is still on record pace at this point. And boy, does he look good. And he told me after the race that this was a portion where he decided to just really kick it in and make the ascent towards the top. Also looking well coming through the circle was Ricardo Mejia. This about two and a half minutes later than Matt at this point. And he, you could see ahead on the trail there, you couldn't even see Carpenter. The third place man, Mohammed El Ahari, coming through holding his side. Okay. He told our photographers that he was okay, but he did hold his side. He looked pretty bad, actually held his side for the whole race. Stan Fox, runner number four, waving at our cameras. He's seen us before, and he looks a little a bit more tired than the other runners as he comes through. Our first female has now made it to the Cirque, waits for a runner to pass her by and moves on through. She shows us her gloves quite well there. She's ready to make her assault on the boulders up above. This is Debbie Wagner, of course, last year's winner 
She is behind Joe Gathercole at this point by about only 20 seconds. She felt she could make it up, but it wouldn't happen. And you know what happens at the Cirque is you are greeted by some very happy people known as the Kazoo Band. Let's listen. If that's not helping cheer you on, I don't know what is. The search and rescue crew at the Cirque each year get the kazoos out, and give us some tunes, as well as cheer the people on as they make their trek towards the top. You see some of the runners here taking their time through the Cirque, but stopping to take some pictures <laughs> along the way as they get ready for what would be the rest. Here's the pack making their way through. They really do look like ants looking down on them from the Cirque. The next spot, as you know from the ascent, is the 16 Golden Stairs, which is really a climb, no doubt, to the top. The first man, of course, Matt Carpenter, as I said, he's really pushing, looking at his watch every second to make sure that he is still on record pace, which he was. Ricardo Mejia was not on ascent record pace, but he's on marathon record pace, as was Matt at this point, moving through the 16 Golden Stairs, and he really couldn't see Matt at this point either. Just looking and plugging ahead, both men know that there was plenty of running still to do. Joe Gathercole, the first woman through the 16 Golden Stairs area. You can see it, the picture darkened a bit here from the clouds that had gathered at the top of the mountain. It would later snow. Debbie Wagner, not too far behind Joe. She would reach the top about 30 seconds behind the lead female. And here's some of the pack running through that same portion. The top, here comes Matt Carpenter. If this isn't moving fast, I don't know what is. Checking his watch to make sure he's still on record pace, and he knew that he had the record if he could just make it up in a matter of seconds. Broke the old record by some 17 seconds, cruising to the top. He did look strong right here, but keep your eye on it. 22 hours, five minutes, and four seconds across the finish line, then trying to rip his number off, Matt collapsed at the top, went down. You see the man with the jacket looking into his eyes. That is Scott Elliott, the Ascent winner. Everyone worried about Matt Carpenter's health at this point. He was not given any assistance as far as oxygen was concerned, but he was out for quite a ways at the top. A good two, maybe two and a half minutes he laid at the top. People watching worried about him, and then the next runner would come up, but not before Matt left. He did not look good as he left the top of the mountain. You can see, finding it hard to walk. He told me later he snuck away from the people that were trying to keep him from running the rest of the marathon, but Matt's that kind of competitor. He wanted to finish. Mere seconds later, our eventual winner of this marathon, Ricardo Mejia, came through, and he looks much stronger. You will notice the difference here. When he crosses the uh, half line, he wants to go. <laughs> they actually hold him back so they can pull off his number to get his time from the top of the mountain, and then he checks his watch, and he is on back down. He had to have seen Matt Carpenter on his way up, how bad Matt looked, and realized that he still had a chance to win this marathon. You see, not too many people at the top of Pikes Peak probably heard about the horrible conditions the day before, but it was really a nice day. This, the third place man, Mohammed Elahari, coming through, getting his number ripped off, and some other people keeping track of who's coming through. This is Stan Fox, who would later fall out of the race. He was in fourth place at this point. He did start back down the mountain, but you see him being passed by Stephen Smallzell, last year's winner in the Mickey Mouse shirt, looking quite well as he headed down towards the end. This is the first woman to reach the top. Joe Gathercole from Wyoming. She led, really, from start to finish over Debbie Wagner, but it was a close race most of the way. Debbie was just 30 seconds behind her when she got to the top. We will start our way down the mountain when we come back. You don't want to miss it, so come back and join us. We start the downhill portion of our race now, which as runners know is a totally different type of running. 
it's every every year I've learned a little bit more about uh, you know downhill running. You just uh, uh, your your back, your hips, your quads, everything is, is you're using totally different muscle groups, uh, and uh, it's it's you can split it into two two races. Uh, really, there's there's a race to the race to the top, and then there's a, there's a race back down. The race back down was quite a race. Matt Carpenter. I don't know where he stopped and got this extra energy, but he was still winning, coming back down through the circuit, and looking a lot better, you might say, as he cruised through there than he did when he left the top. But right on his heels was Ricardo Mejia out of Mexico City. He's won this race before, and he was cruising right behind Matt, and you have to admit that he looked a lot better than Carpenter did. Mohamed El Ahori. Colorado Springs, moving right on through, and our first woman, which is Joe Gathercool of Wyoming, moving on down. She looks strong as well, running this race. Debbie Wagner still can see Joe at this point, and playing it up, and hopefully, maybe, getting back-to-back -back marathon wins. Now, this is the interesting portion of the mountain, because you see, there are not only runners going up, but also runners coming down, and you have to... Uh, make room for them on that one person trail, it can get really tough. As the runners head on down into the trees and back into the cooler area in the shade, you can see that they have quite a long way to go yet before they reach the end of this race. When they got to the switchbacks, it was Mexico's Ricardo Mejia coming through first. He would go on to win this race in a time of three hours, 24, 20, 3, 24, 25. You can see he was cruising, made the downhill portion in an hour and 16 minutes. He was the winner. Matt Carpenter came through the switchbacks next. Still not looking too good, but not looking too bad either. He stops here to check his watch, and you can see how fearful the people were that Matt was going to go down at any portion. Medic following him down the hill there. And here comes El Hari again, holding his side as he runs by. The first woman, Joe Gathercole, really moving through the switchbacks. This is a portion you can really get moving, but you have to watch yourself because you can really slide, take a tumble there on the loose gravel. Debbie Wagner was still behind, oh, falling even further head. behind at this point, about four minutes behind the women's leader. This is the third place woman, Wendy Sanum, coming through the switchbacks. She was looking good as well. The top three women running well at this point. You can see the treacherous footing, though. That man slipping a bit, although he didn't take a tumble, as you make your way on down towards Manitou Springs. All right. We'll be back with the finish of this 37th annual Pikes Peak Marathon right after this, so don't go away. Crowd at the finish line would cheer Mexico's Ricardo Mejia first. He set a course record for the Pikes Peak Marathon, 3:24:25. I spoke with him afterwards. I was behind Matt Carpenter going up the mountain all the way, pushing very hard. Coming back down, I had to try catching him because I had many minutes to make up. Matt pushed me very hard going for the summit and then being so far behind, which is, I thought, two or three minutes, I really had to push hard. Yes, without doubt, I ran a much faster time going after Matt. But Matt would pay the price for running to the top too fast. He came in some 17 minutes behind Mahea. You came out, were you looking for the record? Well, I was looking for uh, two records. I wanted the ascent record and the round trip record, and unfortunately, I paid a big price for getting the ascent record. Was were the, what were the reasonings for that? You think you think just because you came out too strong? 
Um, I don't think I went out too hard, but I really, really pressed the last mile, and at 14,000 feet, I collapsed up there. I, they said I was done, so I kind of snuck out because I knew I had to finish, but, you know. How do you do that? How do you keep coming back to that? I mean, they tell you you're done. What do they have to do to, to make you stop running? Well, I, I don't think they could catch me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, when did he pass you, and did you realize at that point that you'd lost the race, or did you think you had enough in you to catch him? I honestly felt I lost the race when I got to the top. I realized I pressed too hard to get up there. and. You know, it's just like the Triple Crown and those roadrunners learned, you know, that's three races and this is uh, not just the up. I mean, you have to plan for the whole thing and I did well on the up and I didn't do well on the down, so he won. Triple Crown winner again. Uh, how's it feel and does it feel any different and how many times do you have to win it before you say that's enough? It always feels good, you know, KRDO puts on a good event there with the Triple Crown and, you know, it's, it's fun to do a lot of events and test your different abilities. Like I said, the the guys that are fast on the road learned that this is a different game. <laughs> the third and fourth men to the finish line, we pretty much showed you on the way down. Mohamed El Ahori of Colorado Springs came in taking third place. And last year's champion, the defending champion, fared quite well, you might say. Steve Smallzell, sporting Mickey, came down. He's from Boulder, and he would take fourth place. People watching, still waiting for the first woman, and she would round the corner. Joe Gathercole of Wyoming came in with a time of 4.44.15, and I spoke with her after the run. First round trip, how did it feel? It was tough. It's a tough run, but uh, lots of fun. It's just a really fun run. Lots of great people out on the trail, volunteers. It was wonderful. Did you, see, did you have a battle going on there with Deb Wagner, or did you see her, and when did you pass her? I passed her when we first started out on Ruxton Avenue, and then I was ahead of her the rest of the way. Really? Yeah. Did that surprise you? I mean, were you surprised you were in first, or did you come out trying to win? Well, I, I came out actually trying to set a, a personal record for myself of four and a half hours. So I was off that quite a ways and um, really just wanted to finish more than anything else. So I'm a little bit surprised that I took first, yes. <laughs> yeah. But are you going to come back and try and do it again? Probably, yeah. The second place finisher for the women, Debbie Wagner of Draper, Utah. And she was happy with second place. Did you, did you go out to, to win today's race to repeat? Uh, that would have been nice, but um, I've had kind of a different summer. I did Western States this year, and the ride and tie, and a couple of long, long ultras. I've done a couple of 50s. So um, I'm just really glad to be here and not have to hit the shuffle. So that was kind of nice. I didn't get a blister, but I felt really good and strong the whole way, and the time was the same as last year, so I'm just really excited. In all, 613 runners made the long trek to the top and on back down, including our own Vince Greco, who I had a chance to sit down and talk with after he finally finished. Here comes the great runner. First off, you told me before you started, you said starting out, you're just going to run your own race. Were you feeling, how'd you feel when you got to the trailhead? Going up uh, the paved part's the most deceiving part of this race course because it's straight uphill for 1.2 miles. And by the time I got to the trailhead, I'm not gonna lie to you, I was tired. Really? Yep, and I ran just to as far as our camera, ran about another 50 yards and stopped. <laughs> <laughs> how about the, through the switchbacks? I mean, how hard is that? It looks like a pretty steep part. It, until you get to the top of Mount Manitou, it's just back and forth, back and forth, no rest. I tried to run like one switchback, maybe walk two switchbacks, run one walk two and then when you get to the top of the incline you got some rolly hills and you're really able to get a lot back <coughs> excuse me back on the top of mount manitou next portion of the race were there people at bar camp or no there were tons of i mean there was a lot of people at bar camp that was kind of the midpoint of the race at bar camp and to, up to bar camp i was feeling decent but right at the eight mile mark i had the worst <coughs> cramps in my calves and in my thighs that you have ever seen. I was just about ready to stop at that point. What kept you going? Well, I stopped, massaged them a little bit, then just tried to walk through them. I had hundreds of people on the trail stop <clears throat> to ask if they could help you, and it just went away. <laughs> so so did it help you out, I mean, having all those other people on the course? Oh, that's the best part of the race. Everybody's so encouraging. The people that are coming down that have made it to the top first, keep going, you're gonna get there. Only a few more miles, and we said the same thing coming back down. Great. Um, how about the Cirque? When you get to the Cirque, I mean, you see a sign that's kind of fooling you, telling you it's a mile to the top. The worst part of that 
is the switchbacks up there because you're down at like 11,000 feet and you can see almost the finish line and people up there are ants and you're thinking, my God, I'm never going to get there, ever. And at that point, I wasn't really running. It was survival. <laughs> then you get to the top and you turn around uh, you say you felt like quitting but you didn't why not well because all of you would have given me a real hard time everybody on the trail said Vince we're real proud of you I know you're gonna make it so there's a little bit of peer pressure involved and plus for me it's a one-shot deal I am NOT doing it again <laughs> you ran it in six hours 47 minutes was that anywhere close to what you thought you'd do better than you thought you'd do I thought it was maybe just a little better than I thought I'd do, especially when it took me over four hours to get to the top. Um, it, the trail's so deceiving. When you turn around, you get fresh legs, fresh wind, you get a refill on your water bottle, and everything just starts coming into place. But about halfway down again, it's just gruesome on your feet. Yeah, and the reception down here, would you, that, that help you out getting to the finish line? Tell you honest, Scott Drew, I ran to the Cog Railroad Station. Everyone's going, less than a half a mile to go. Who cares? I had to stop, get a drink of water, and then uh, I was no way going to walk across the finish line. <laughs> but I would encourage a lot of people to do it. I mean, even if it's just a one-shot deal, I didn't train very much last month. That was my big downfall. But uh, if you take your time going up, you can get down. Uh, here's a look at the top five men. If you're wondering, Vince Greco was 301st on the men's side of this race. Ricardo Mejia from Mexico. The next four men were from Colorado. The top four ladies had three women from Colorado. The three, four, and five were from Lakewood, Colorado Springs, and Colorado Springs, respectively. Now, stay tuned. We're going to come back with the KRDO Triple Crown winners right after this. You can probably give us these names from memory. You remember these people from years before the KRDO Triple Crown of Running Winners. On the men's side, Matt Carpenter. Yes, a very familiar name. The ladies' side, another familiar name, Janie De La Cour, taking the Triple Crown, and she has done it many, many times before. Now, if you're wondering how you did in either the ascent or the marathon, you can get those running results by this 900 number, 1-900-740-3939. Now remember, there's going to be a $2 per minute charge for this call, so uh, I guess if you're younger than 18, ask your parents before you make that call. But the marathon will go on again next year, and that's when you may have to make yourself make this long trek. If you've never run it before, be prepared. You know, they call this the ultimate challenge. And maybe by next year, you can muster up your strength and join us for the 38th Pikes Peak Marathon. We'll be looking for you, and we'll see you then.